Welcome to Movies That Matter, the podcast about recent films going above and beyond the call of box office returns to boldly explore a social issue affecting people's lives. I'm Nicole Fanari. And I'm Stacy Moore. Stacy, what movie are we going to analyze this week? This week we're overanalyzing Downsizing, the Matt Damon vehicle about Paul Safronic, who undergoes a shrinking procedure and moves to a resort community for the shrunk in an effort to start a new life. What did we think? Okay, so the movie got a lot of mixed reviews. Were you aware of that going into it? No, I heard afterwards. Okay, so that kind of dampened my expectations, I think, which helps... Because I thought it was fine. I don't know why everybody disliked it so much. What did you think? I thought it was really sweet. I, I can see why, I can see where the criticisms were well-founded. Like, there were serious pacing issues. <laughs> like, it's really, it's very thorough. It's very thorough, and it's um, kind of in its world-building and its character-building and, and it's sort of like contemplations of, of various themes. Uh, and there's no, I mean, there's certainly no traditional sort of narrative arc. It's really more of a character arc than anything. Mm-hmm. Um, so I could see where, where people would have trouble. I don't know. I could see why it didn't do well. I could see why it didn't do well. But at the same time, I thought it was really quite thoughtful and and funny in places and really beautiful in other places. Um, there yeah, was one scene that actually it. brought me to tears. Like there were, I mean, there were actually a couple of times where I got teary and, a couple, and like of several where I, was, I actually laughed out loud. And the characters were all so interesting. Like they weren't characters you usually see in movies. I, I, did, I thought I really enjoyed it. I, it wasn't like an amazing film, but I, I really did enjoy it. Yeah, me too. It's not like I'm like, oh, total Oscar contender, but I'm, mm. I don't feel the non-money that I spent. Thank you, Movie Pass. <laughs> yeah. No, they're not, they're not sponsoring the podcast yet, but one day, hopefully, um, that I, 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 I didn't feel like my time was wasted. And for a movie that was over two hours, I didn't. I wasn't like, oh my gosh, when is this going to end? We all know how much I hate long movies. That's right. Yeah. So, I, 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 uh, I, you know, I, I want to say Matt. Okay, Matt Damon is not my favorite guy right now. Um, but I thought he was <sighs> fine. I thought he was pretty. Um, like he was very sympathetic, and and when he's like when he's at that party at the at the at his apart, uh, neighbor's apartment and he's like mm-hmm. just walking around like rolling <laughs> <laughs> just rolling like crazy and and he just like kind of saunters up to that one group and without introducing himself says i'm going to take off my shoes <laughs> <laughs> i laughed so hard I mean, yeah it was it was pretty entertaining his performance is entertaining I thought Hong Chao was was glorious as Nook Lan. Um, she was, was great. So and her, her great. Like, yeah, her big emotional speech definitely had me tearing up. Oh, um, yes, she, absolutely. She was very believable as that character. Like she was forceful and about things, and and just insisting that he do stuff, which to me was. So it was so believable that she was this dissident activist in her own country by the way mm-hmm. that she would get other people to do things for her, you know? Mm-hmm. I just thought, oh, yeah, that's exactly what someone who is capable of leading large protests in Vietnam would be like. Very secure in their convictions, very forceful about getting other people to go along with them, you know? It was, to me, it was just the way she was was so right to her backstory. Right. Yeah, she was a she was a great character, very layered, um, very strong. Like I, I think a lot of times, like Asian female characters are kind of they're all sort of suffering and dainty and stoic. Um, but Nook Lan was none of those things. I mean, she suffered, but she was 
like you said, she was a, a forceful character. She was like a force of nature. Like she just sort of swept through and would just leave things differently than how she found them. Um, yeah. And, and was just very no nonsense. And the uh, and again, Hong Chao was, was great. She's apparently from New Orleans, um, but her parents are Vietnamese. Um, so I, that's, I, I think that's part of how she got that performance to be so... Like the accent in particular was so authentic. Um, so yeah, every every time she came on screen, I was just riveted. <laughs> and and also Christoph Waltz made my day yeah. when when he yeah, I didn't know was he was in it. <laughs> yes, yes. When I, when he showed up, I, I <laughs> that really like extreme close up where you were like Christoph Waltz is in this. <laughs> I was like yes. And that character, uh, what was his name? Tucson is just yes. so perfect. He's like the equal but opposite of Nuklon. He is, he is like, I've met that guy, you know, like oh, over yes, and so over. Oh, yeah, so have I. Yeah, that, yes. he was just, he got that character to a T. Um, he really did. You know. And he is just, I mean... I will follow that man anywhere. He tells me to go and I don't even (laughs) care if he's playing like a complete jerk at the time. It'd just be like, oh, okay, uh uh-huh. I will do that. Even into Tarzan. We followed him into Tarzan. (laughs) And he is just so... Yeah. So I think then that was the problem with Matt Damon is that Christoph Waltz just exudes charm from every pore Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. Matt Damon really doesn't <laughs> um he was the weak the weak link for me in the movie like he was just mm. kind of flat um he was i cared less about what happened to him than pretty much anybody else in the movie um that's true and is really... it is that well okay so is that damon's uh issue or i i wonder if it was just lazy writing in that sense. I, I, I felt like that character was just, I mean, he was just sort of presented as kind of a, like a sincere, well-meaning schmuck. Um, but that's really mm-hmm. all we, we got, I felt like, for him. Well, like, was, you know. He was very kind, though. He was very helpful, even in the beginning. Of the, yes. You know, you see him just... Because he still has the occupational therapy background, he helps out um, a coworker. Mm-hmm. Um, I just uh, so I will say this: I think that leading man is can often be a, a difficult part to pull off because you are sort of the straight man for everybody else, and you just sort of have to like be charismatic and beam that on the screen when you don't often have a whole lot more to do because you're just sort of a foil for other people. Oh, sure. And I think that there are actors who can do that, and there are actors who can't, you Mm -hmm. know? Like, I actually think Brad Pitt is a good example of an actor who's basically a lousy leading man, really good (laughs) as a character actor, basically. Um, He can do weird. He can play funny, interesting people. Yes, he can. Yes. He can. Yeah. Like Snatch and and, uh, Fight Club or evidence of that, yeah. Right, but I thought he was lousy in the curious case of Benjamin Button. Sure. And I think Oceans, the Ocean series works because George Clooney can be leading man, as can Tom Hanks. I don't know, like George Clooney and Tom Hanks could just stand around and do nothing and they're still somehow interesting. That's, That's true. It's not a quality every actor has, and I just, I don't think Matt Damon, I don't, to me, Matt Damon hasn't ever really had it. I was just going to say, and also, shut up. No one wants to hear from you anymore, Matty. I know, I know. Well, that's actually what I was getting at. Is I was going to say next was I. I think that this movie, after the sort of lukewarm, not even lukewarm. That's rather kind. The not so great reception of Suburbicon. Um, mm-hmm. I think, and then you know his his publicity, recent publicity flubs. Um, this movie was pretty much the final referendum on whether or not he could be an anchor for a major film Mm. and it did not do well downsizing did not do well 
Like, I think the opening weekend, it made, like, $7 million. <laughs> but didn't it go up against Star Star Wars? It did. It did. Um, okay. I, you know, for, well, I, at the end of the day, you know, when, when they, when the production companies look at his numbers, like, this, this movie was marketed on being a movie that Matt Damon was in. Like, I literally saw ads where, you know, several movies would be described, and when it would get to downsizing, the, the actual blurb was, Matt Damon stars in Downsizing. <laughs> Come see it. And so they were basically, you know, betting the bank on... Or betting the farm, or gosh, whatever. I don't know. What do people bet these days? I don't know. But on on Matt Damon selling this movie, and he didn't. And that's two in a row, plus the bad press. I I don't know. I'm just saying, I, I wonder if we're not going to see so much of him for a while, you know? Mm. Yeah, I don't know. So let's take a small step back. Um, okay. I do think that... So mileage is going to vary on this type of movie, which sort of, um, I like to call it, it's kind of in the realm of what I would call magical realism, where it's not pure fantasy or pure sci-fi because it's still kind of rooted in the real world. Uh-huh. Um, so the most prominent example I can think that's coming to mind is being John Malkovich, uh, where you just sort of have to go along with the conceit of the movie and any attempt to explain it is just going to be usually a des- a disaster which they didn't even try in this movie they're just like it shrinks you you put it in the thing and you're smaller like great <laughs> they put you in an easy bake <laughs> oven <laughs> yes and it shrinks you yeah um which they then like reinforce with like scooping the now shrunken people up with a spatula i totally didn't make that connection until you said that that's hilarious <laughs> they um, really do look like little gingerbread men. <laughs> yeah, they totally do. I just don't. I that is exactly what that imagery was aiming for, and I didn't see it. But now that you're saying it, it's, you're totally right. Um, so I I like those kind of movies, but if you don't, this isn't going to be fun for you. That's a great point. It, it's um, I think maybe one of the reasons it didn't it couldn't really appeal to one or the other group is because it was in this weird in-between place between uh, sci-fi fantasy and just kind of a, you know, run-of-the-mill comedy. Mm-hmm. And it, it was almost like it was trying to straddle that those two genres, which I enjoyed. But, uh, yeah, like, to your point, like, I, I could see how, you know – Either one or, or the other audience would kind of look at it and go, that's not really for me. Yeah. I think, I could, again, I think it's hard to carry off. And I think, actually, for me, my one, one of my complaints about the film would, would honestly be there wasn't enough gimmick, gimmicky small people things. Mm. Like, I could have had a whole lot more of silly camera tricks and, like, gingerbread men. I, 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 I and the world building, like, I yeah. thought it was really fun, and I liked the cinematography. Um, it looked was really a, good. Yes. There was a really nice – can I just shout out to the fact that there was, like, a really nice dissolve when they're in Norway from them, like, being um, – leaving the, the colony on Norway to, like, a dissolve to them on the boat. And I was like, yay, a dissolve. <laughs> like, I feel like I've had my, you know, movie critic – hat on and been really trying to heavily analyze like lighting and editing and all of these things and and haven't really seen anything too novel on that front and I was so irrationally excited to see it dissolve <laughs> and there were a bunch towards the beginning as well yeah I noticed but I, I felt like they weren't as well used at the beginning because it almost felt like this scene's over now now we're gonna pass through some time here's the next scene um, so, yeah, I did. Yeah. The time jumps, the very explicit now it's two years later, I think got tiresome. Yeah, just just fast forward and we'll figure out where we are kind of thing. It was a little dumbed down for the audience that I didn't think was necessary. Um, but yeah, I mean, I liked the giant butterflies. I oh, liked those the are like bus that's with the little people and the big people reminded me so much of Zootopia. 
Um, I love the movers, the movers carrying his wedding ring on their shoulder. <laughs> yeah. And the keepsake box that you see them hold and it's an awkward shape and then you see that it like fits onto the truck. That was so that can, was delightful. Yeah. Yeah. So the conceit in the movie is they can shrink, they can apparently shrink organic things, but they can't shrink non-organic things. Mm -hmm. um, although that gets a little bit problematic. But again, you kind of just have to go with it. There's going to be sort of there was there were some holds and holes in in that whole thing. Sure. Um, sure. I, I nearly lost it when uh, Noklan is telling the story about her friend's husband who didn't make it through the procedure because they left they left in one of his crowns. Oh no, head, I know. His head exploded. She's just describing how the man's head exploded. <laughs> and this is why we're really such a great team. Because you think that's funny and I was horrified. <laughs> no, I was dying. I was dying. <laughs> yeah, you would. <laughs> oh, man, oh, man, oh, man. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, right. They would. They tried to be somewhat thorough. But, yeah, there were points where it was just like, you just, just go with it. You get the idea. It's, it's, a, it's a, a concept. So, yeah, it's a metaphor, right? Right. right. Um, so I guess that sort of leads us to the burning question. Would you downsize yourself? And the movie is presented as first and foremost to um, cure the problem of of climate change and overpopulation. Mm, um, right, right. But then on the flip side, they present the the idea that because you're so tiny and everything is made for big people sized, your entire lifestyle would get so drastically cheaper, you'd basically be wealthy and never have to work again. Right. So when you were watching it, I know you were thinking, like, would you do it? I, I would not, um, and not for any other reason other than um, it's they too much commitment. No, no, no. <laughs> it's just too much commitment. I, I won't even get a tattoo because... I don't want to have to think like, oh, wait, am I going to want this removed later? Because I, I okay. wouldn't be able to undo it, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't do it. How about you? I, I am exceedingly distressed that I topped out at my physical height of 5'5". Five five. Um, subtracting the first five <laughs> from <laughs> that height. <laughs> Would just be way too prob problematic. I, there's a certain dependency on it that you still need big people to do a whole bunch of stuff. That's right. So all I could see was the loss of control, which... Right. Um, Suddenly being very wanna, vulnerable. Yeah. If you want to psychoanalyze us on Twitter, go ahead. <laughs> I know. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Um, so I felt like... I also, but I did think, and then, then so this is the, the weird thing about the movie. There's a lot of potential paths this movie could have gone down, but it mm -hmm. didn't. Um, so the other thing I thought that was interesting about the movie and the, the reason to do it was for a lot of people to never have to work again. Uh -huh. But I, I, I don't have this need to, like, live a life of leisure. Mm-hmm. But I did think, um, so there have been many works of science fiction, um, sort of Star Trek most prominently, uh, about what happens when no one needs to work anymore. Uh -huh. And I remember having a conversation with um, someone I work with who's a lawyer about that, you know, what that means and what people do. And I, I kind of looked at her and I said, don't, don't you think we're like mostly there you know our, our economy is completely services now if we manufacture things for the most part they're manufactured by robots and I have this job that pays me way too much money and is entirely sort of fabricated and I don't really know what real value I create by by doing my you know economist job and I just think 
it's just an inv invention for to give me something to do because nobody really needs to work anymore. And she just looked at me like aghast. And she thought, and she's just was like, oh gosh, my life has no meaning. My work has no meaning. I was like, we're already there. <laughs> like, we, we're just making up work for us to do. So um, I thought maybe the movie was going to explore that a little more, although it didn't go down that road. I think that's probably more true for you and me because we live in the federal DC bubble. <laughs> like we're in the federal industry where literally nothing we do means anything. <laughs> I think outside D.C. people are actually making things. <laughs> I mean, some people are, but again, there's like increasing mechanization. We're overwhelmingly a service economy. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think it's entirely tr just a D.C. factor. Um, I think it's probably more a Western factor than it is other places. But I just I think there is going to come a time in our maybe not in our lifetime, but not so far in the distant future where people really just won't need to work anymore. And I thought it created an interesting dichotomy, which I, I actually did appreciate the movie sort of resolves why there were workers in the small world. Because you see him accidentally fall on hard times and have to get a job. And it brings up, you know, immigration and refugees and all those things as to why there might be a class of people who... Um, or, or even people who are forcibly shrunk as, as she was, um, as to why that, you know, people would be small, but also not be wealthy. Yeah, I think, I think that's probably more what they're trying to get at. The, the whole shrinking metaphor and the reason that none of them are working, I think is, uh, evidence that it's a pretty, it's a pretty clean metaphor for retired expatriates. Mm. There's, you know what I mean? There's like this, this tendency in the past, I don't know, 10, 10 or 15 years now where people are, you know, they're getting older, they're retiring and they're realizing that they can barely afford a, the home that they used to, you know, live in and, be their medications, you know, like with those two things down, like they're, they're, you know, with no, so with like little, only a little bit of social security and hardly any pensions anymore. Their retirement is only covering like, you know, the, the interest off their savings is only covering like just basic, basic, like survival kind of amenities. Um, and then your friends come along and they say, oh, haven't you heard you can move to Mexico or Thailand or India or Costa Rica and move under this resort where your U.S. dollar goes 20 times farther and you get to live like a king in a big walled off community where you never even have to talk to anyone who didn't grow up speaking English. Um, you have to leave all your friends and family, but, you know, you, you get to live like a Kardashian um, until you die. And isn't that nice? Um, and so that's like a lot of people are, are doing now, you know, and, and you, like, I think, I think that's why the guy in the bar kind of gives him a hard time about, you know, why should, he's like, sh why should small people have the same voting rights as us, even though you're not, you know, you're not contributing to the economy in the same way. Like that's something that expats get a lot is, you know, why you're not even living, you know, you've left the country. You took all your money and you left the country. Why should you even get to vote? So I, I think that it's essentially a movie about the global 1% becoming aware of the effects of their lifestyle and, mm -hmm. like, what that the effects on the rest of the world, e.g. post-colonial poverty and making the earth uninhabitable for human life. Um, because that's what I think happens a lot of the times is like you, you, these people go out to these resorts, they, you know, you know, are taking advantage of this, this huge disparity in, in economic power. Mm -hmm. And, and I think most of the time, not ever looking at those people, you know, the other, their new neighbors in the eye 
and and you know really facing the fact that like you know you're prosperous because someone else is not you know mm-hmm. and i and i that's i think that's why i i really did like all the aspects of him when he when he gets on that bus with Noklan and 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 drives outside the dome and into that yeah, there's and it's like basically like a shanty town Yes, yep. like a tenement, like, yeah, exactly, and he sees, I actually, that was one of the moments where I teared up, because it was just so beautiful, like, just seeing mm-hmm. the, like, the late, you know, just the stacked up, um, you know, tenement housing, and all, of, there's this really beautiful moment where in the, in the space, in the center, you realize that all of these folks who are, it is implied, are from, you know, Latin American countries, are all <laughs> seated in front of this They've all, they're all shrunken just like Fat David and they're looking up at this regular size TV, but to them looks like a movie screen and it's playing a telenovela Mm -hmm. and just like that whole, I feel like they just really nailed that, um, that sort of aesthetic there. Um, and I, I, when I realized that that's where it was going, I was just so happy, (laughs) so happy that I was like that's okay that's what this movie's gonna is gonna tell me that's what this movie is gonna explore and it and it maybe it didn't maybe it didn't but that was that was the intent and um and I really applauded that um and I don't know so when earlier when you were asking me if I would shrink like maybe I wouldn't maybe I wouldn't but I there is a very real question as to like would I retire to a developing nation Mm mm-hmm and I think I would. I think I would. I would try. I would try really hard to be a uh, an involved, you know, citizen and a, you know, and a and a good neighbor. I would try to like actually be involved in like the community that I was, you know, in, and not just hide in my in my walled off gated palace for, slash fortress. Um, but I wouldn't be against that, you know. At all, but that's that's key though to me is that like you know, we don't just go to these poor nations and say hooray! I'm so glad that you know you being poor makes me feel rich in comparison. I'm, yeah, not, I'm not sure. I, yeah, I'm not even sure. I'm saying if yeah, I don't I don't want to like vilify people who do that, but I, I do think it's worth thinking about. No, I do too, and I, I mean, I was thinking about that, and the movie doesn't isn't as explicit about this issue but so um plot wise they end up determining that just shrinking people not enough people decided to be shrunk and it's not enough to stop climate change in the world that human beings are going to go extinct so the original colony in norway decides to um sort of go bunker town on this one although it's sidebar when christoph waltz was like um people are people and being trapped in this bunker everyone's just gonna kill each other that was kind of my first thought too when i saw i i almost stood plan. up and started clapping <laughs> like yeah, i was like I, yes I was, he's right listen to him he's like this is a cult um, and they're all gonna kill each other down there <laughs> yes like, absolutely uh, so i uh, but I was thinking, you know, looking at the group of people who who were in this original colony and the sort of continuing of the human race, they don't get into a eugenics argument at all. But there's mm-hmm. a sense of like only the privileged people chose were in this original group of people that are now going to carry on the human race. I'm blanking on her character's name. Uh, Nam Luck? Do I have that right? Uh, no, Nuklan. Nuklan, sorry. No worries. Apologies to everyone I'm offending by not remembering a name. Um, <laughs> she, you know, she makes the case, but there are people here now who need help. Mm-hmm. Um, and very much sets apart the, the ease with which people can focus on climate change and the environment which has always been my complaint about environmentalists like yes i'm happy they're environmentalists and we should absolutely do something about climate change but like look at the set of people who worry about those problems and look at the set of people who worry about human rights and who's affected and it just i think the movie does um a sort of 
depressing job of showing you that inequality follows you wherever you go. Mm -hmm. I mean, ultimately, the moral message of the movie is helping everybody get ahead is more worthwhile than sort of taking the selfish decision of helping yourself get ahead. Yeah, I think so. It's it certainly doesn't um it certainly doesn't present a plan or or even the suggestion that it's possible to um eliminate inequality. It does kind of I feel like the movie kind of accepts inequality as like a fact of life. Um Oh yeah, no it does. Yeah. Again. Right. That, that and, no matter and then what the you same, do, you replicate it. Right. But at the same time, like do what you can. Right, which is what um, he learns from Nuklan and um, and eventually decides to devote his life to is just, well, you know, I'm just going to, this is my life. This is, these are the opportunities I have to help. And that's what I'm going to do on a daily basis for as long as I can, um, which is really, really nice. <laughs> like, that's kind yeah, of a nice just, message. It is, again, so sort of the like, oh, this movie is so terrible. I was like. It's a really nice message that, you know, helping people, it's its own reward and its own worthwhile life goal. Um, although, again, I mean, you know, it's it's sort of unwittingly timely with, with the pass, passing of the latest tax bill, which is just mm. solidly aimed at transferring oh, no. um, wealth from the poor to the rich. Uh, so, right. Good luck, poor people. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, the only reason we've avoided, avoided class warfare thus far is because we've basically fed that fire with the kindling of racial resentment instead. No predictions on how long that will last. It's already lasted way longer than I thought. I thought people would wise up to their economic problems long before now, but they haven't. So I guess we're stuck with Nazis. Um, but I mean, I just everybody like everybody talks about inequality, but nobody does anything about it. <laughs> sure. Sure. The, I think. <sighs> yeah, I mean, I I really enjoyed like the kind of the the sort of thematic, not thematic, the tonal dichotomy. Of the movie, and again, I know we already mentioned that's probably a reason that it didn't do well, but I did like the, you know, and I think that's something director Alexander Payne um, does well, uh, and you can sort of see it in his films Nebraska and Election, where he's dealing with pretty heady issues, right? Heady themes, mm -hmm. but with comedy, like it's funny. You're, you're mm -hmm. laughing the whole time, but there's, like, this underlying darkness <laughs> to, in, in all cases. Um, and I think that happens here. You know, so we are, we are watching, you know, this, this we're watching people um, perpetuate the very problems that you're talking about. Right. But it's hysterical. Willfully blindly. <laughs> you know, it, it's hysterical, but also disturbing. <laughs> right. And I, I guess that's what I'm saying. Like, I wonder if, if, the, if the backlash is, stems from our own discomfort with the way that, you know, we perpetuate these problems and we don't do enough to stop them or it's it's not it's not an in your face movie it doesn't mm -hmm. it doesn't really throw like oh this is so horrible it just shows people making different decisions like the message is somewhat over but i just wonder i totally agree with you there's a darkness at the center of this movie that you yourself kind of have to contend with for the most part, I mean, I'm not as I'm sort of making an assumption about the type of person who goes to see this movie mm -hmm. of how you're complicit in the system. And if you would make different choices, if you would be the one who just be like the Jason Sudeikis character, take the mansion and F everybody else. Right. Uh, just I to, to your 
the what you mentioned about the the audiences that would go see this movie. You've got two two types of people would could possibly see this movie, right? The people who are complicit and benefit from the system, right? Who could be, you know, like it's not fun to think about. It could be uncomfortable trying to grapple with it. Or you're a poor person <laughs> who, you know, I, I don't know why you would pay $14 to go see this if you're poor, but let's say you do. Um, you don't want to be reminded that you're poor. <laughs> That's no fun. Like, yeah, I know about all this. I know that I'm, like, screwed by this system. Mm. So um, there isn't really, I mean, no one's going to go watch this movie and be like, this makes me feel <laughs> totally comfortable <laughs> with my position in this universe. No, that's actually a really good point, that if you are someone who can really identify with a Matt Damon character, seeing him try to get ahead and fail but learn this wonderful moral message that he has to help people out while living in this, you know, crappy apartment really isn't going to feel, it's going to feel like cold comfort. <laughs> You're not wrong <laughs> about that either. Like, oh, right. great. I just need to help people. Thanks a lot. I can't pay my bills. Like, <laughs> uh, yeah. 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 Although having said that, I, so apparently there are two people in the world that could possibly enjoy this movie and we're, they're both on this podcast. <laughs> I it's, I feel bad for I feel bad for Alexander Payne. I, I really like him as a director, and I feel like this is a really, you know, it was a I I laud him for for making a go of it. It's it's an important thing to talk about, and you don't normally hear it talked about much at all. It's certainly not in a mainstream in a major motion picture. So it's I'm, I am sorry that it didn't do better, but I guess I you know I'm not shocked. Yeah, I, I, huh. I mean, everyone's saying it's it's just been a really down year in Hollywood in general. I don't, yeah, I don't know what to say, but I just, I just sort of wonder about the Netflix afterlife and and that type of stuff. Um, I I did read some of the negative critical reviews, and I just remember thinking, like, boy, you're really hard on this. I don't know why you're being so hard? Like, on why this are you movie. so angry? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'm a little bit. I'm just a little bit baffled. Yeah. So I guess, you know, uh, privileged white ladies who consider themselves somewhat woke. Yes, all all of us could get to ha- together, get together and have like a little book club meeting about it um, or just listen to this podcast. I, I guess just other things I really liked about it. I, I like that we got to step through different examples of people trying to live a fulfilled life. Um, you know, we saw what well, we saw the the Norwegian um, commune, right? We see, mm-hmm. uh, you know, like you said, Jason Sudeikis and his, you know, Mick Mansion. We saw yes. um, uh, Tushan. Were those mansions Tushan, like right? out- Yeah. Can I just say that the houses were the ugliest things I've ever seen? <laughs> <laughs> I, all I could think was, well, who needs to live in a house that big? What do you need a house that big for? Just the two of you. You need an 18-room house. Oh, it was hit. and even just the one he and his wife look at in the beginning, like still in the big world, I guess we yes, call it. Yes, so I'm big. like that. She's like in awe, and I'm like, oh, my God, that, that house is hideous. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, no, I guess it depends on taste. I don't know. I was just thinking like. You'd have to like you get exhausted walking from room to room. I oh well I don't know but yeah so we also get to see we also get to see like you know uh, Tushan with all of his like you know Euro trash friends like so that's another thing about if you if you go and live and re- you know settle in a um, in a retirement community in an expat community you're gonna meet mm-hmm. Tushan <laughs> and you're going to you are going to be at, like at least by accident be at his parties because those people are there. And, um, and they were all, but in any case, these were all presented as like sci-fi kind of fantastical situations, but I've seen each of these in action. And, you know, I've seen like the, the Swedish kind of like Trustafarians with, you know, with their drum circles on the beach and, and all of this and, and each group thinks they've got so (laughs) on point and each group thinks they've got it figured out. But there's like a toxic dysfunction like underlying each one of these like sort of utopian plans that kind of it 
at the end of the movie, I was I, I couldn't help but thinking of Gulliver's Travels. Like this movie was like a, mm. it was very reminiscent of Gulliver's Travels. With like, in addition to also him being like small in a big world, and you know, vice versa. There was just like wow, good gu- reference. Thank you. Yeah, there yeah, was like he, no, that... basically Gulliver would go to like different places. Places, yes. You know that... what I mean? That were all metaphors yes. for. I'm feeling for... very literary right now. Um. But yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I really enjoyed fire, that. Fire, easy bake, Thank oven, you. gingerbread <laughs> men, Gulliver's <laughs> Travels. Maybe I should just stop here. All right, good night, everybody. Um, yeah, no, I you're yeah. killing this podcast. Thanks. Just along for the ride. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but yeah, I just thought, I really loved that that sort of aspect of it. it. Was him going basically passing through each of these worlds and seeing how. Like, have they got it figured out? No. Have they got it figured out? No. And then eventually just kind of having to to look around and just be like, well, I guess maybe I should just stick with what I've got and just do my best to help people rather than trying to create an elaborate utopia around me where, I, you know, everything's perfect and I don't have to worry about anything. Like, I'm going to have to worry about stuff, and things aren't going to be perfect, and I'm just going to have to, like, do my best to help the people around me with the skills and knowledge I have. Yeah, I agree. Which then brings us to the very sad moment of our podcast where I think we have to give this a social impact score of zero or one because no one saw it, right? But it has some real interesting themes. Um, I think you're absolutely right. Sad. Well, maybe it does. maybe movies that matter will breathe some new life into it, and we'll, we'll repost <laughs> the episode when it's all on streaming stuff. Because we have that kind of power. No, we don't. I know. Um, we'll get. <laughs> we'll get. Hopefully, we'll get what three extra views on Netflix. We're still enjoying belated Christmas presents or Hanukkah presents. Or some <gasps> other kind of present that you want to give me and Stacy of an Solstice. iTunes review? <laughs> yeah. if, if you feel guilty that you didn't get us one on time, now is your shot. Um, it's not too late. It's not too it's late. It's not too late. They're appreciated any time of year. So we hope you enjoyed this episode of Movies That Matter. If you did, please check us out on our website, www.moviesthatmatterpodcast.com. With links to things we've discussed. Um, if you want to talk to us, leave a comment on our Facebook page or on Twitter with our tag at Movies Matter Pod. And you can check Twitter to find out what movie we're over analyzing next. And remember, movies matter. And so do you. We'll see you next time. <laughs> <laughs>